Now the motto for this channel, OTR Central, is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And, and I feel that's true. But maybe when it comes to No Mercy, it's one of those cases where maybe it's not. Maybe you enjoy No Mercy. Maybe you like this show. Maybe you got caught up in the specter of Cena versus Reigns. Maybe you enjoyed the Beast versus Braun for whatever reason. Then maybe this isn't the channel for you. Because apparently you don't need me to sit there and crap on this for you. But for the rest of you, you probably came here looking for me to crap on it. Even if you don't agree with me. Well, believe me, I'm going to do plenty of crapping on No Mercy. Because before this show on the predictions video, I said, I opined, that they should call this Lord Have Mercy or Please Have Mercy on us. And after this three hour plus shit fest of a show Sunday night, I was tapping. I was begging for mercy. It was so bad I didn't even do the review Sunday night because I just didn't have the energy. The, the suck of this night just drained enough out of me. I'm like, ah, screw it. I'll just talk about it tomorrow. And that's what it was. Like the pre-show. Apollo Crews versus Elias. Imagine how stupid you feel if you thought Uha Nation had a chance in this company. And then imagine how mad you're all going to be, will all be, and how stupid we'll all feel when this company ultimately screws up Elias. Because, newsflash, there's a 98% chance that's going to happen. That's not negative. That is playing the freaking odds here, people. It's the smart money. When you get to the main card, you kick off with the IC Championship. Should this have opened? Maybe, maybe not. But it ultimately did, and I was okay with it doing that. Because so many things about this match made sense. So many things about this match were done the right way. It was really interesting there in L.A. that Miz, for all intents and purposes, was the babyface. He wasn't trying to be the babyface. It was just naturally kind of the way he was doing it. But ultimately, the way this match was booked, it was planned out, the right guy won in the right way. No complaints. The exact type of opening match you should get on a pay-per-view. But then you get that post-match Jason Jordan interview where, to me, you see the character potential and you see the possibility, the smug kind of heel smirk, a kind of funny looking one eye going this way, the other eye going that way type of stupid ass look. Just the way he kind of walks, his posture. So many things about him screams out heel. And then he opens his mouth and says some drivel and then ultimately says the Miz sucks. And this is supposed to get the kid over? Again, you look at a kid... And you sit there and say, oh my God, this is a young, good-looking kid. He is different based off of pigment. Variety of reasons. That's a big one. But that is something that could be used to help him stand out and become a star. So why so stubbornly cling to this notion of sending him one way when it is clearly obvious that if you send him the other way, man, the sky is truly the limit. And someday you could bring him back and he could be one of your top guys. But instead, as we know with certain guys, the WWE just stubbornly clings to what they believe in and they dig in their heels and they try to force it down your throat. And the problem is this isn't the 80s anymore. That shit don't work no matter how much their propaganda tries to spin it like it does. See John Cena in his decade of doom. See Roman Reigns today. And Finn Balor versus Bray Wyatt. After the entrances, they might as well not do anything. Because ultimately their characters are nothing, the guys are nothing, and ultimately their matches together have largely been nothing. Once you get past the paint versus paint crap, now it's the man versus the man, and who gives a shit? And when you look at Finn Balor, while his gear might be gray, he can just please go the fuck away. It is ridiculous. The fact that so many people think this guy is great. And again, it is easy to blame WWE. And there's so many things you can blame WWE for. But sometimes it's just a matter of guys get exposed. This dude doesn't fucking have it, period. And the shit they do pre-match 
when Bray Wyatt fucking throws Finn Balor through the table and here's Finn Balor selling his ribs like a punk ass bitch acting like he's gonna not partake in the fucking match who's booking this shit and then ultimately Finn Balor is able to overcome that and beat the dude that's 100 pounds heavier than him with 10 times the facial hair it, to me, it makes Finn Balor look stupid because that one thing was potentially going to take him out of the match and it took Bray Wyatt bullying him and talking shit to him to get him to even come back into the ring. And then you make Bray Wyatt... Uh, you always make Bray Wyatt look stupid, so what the fuck is next? And if Finn Balor is ultimately Brock Lesnar's next opponent, fuck WWE for that lame-ass shit, period. Uh, what wasn't lame-ass, I will say this, is the Raw Tag Team Championship match. Even though I didn't really care about either one of the teams, even though I didn't really care about the story, even though I did not really care about the match, I will give the guys credit for the effort that they put in. Their effort level was top-notch. It was spectacular. And I can only imagine back there in gorilla position or in the production truck how much Kevin Dunn must have cringed once Cesaro busted its two front teeth. And shit happens. Don't blame Seth Rollins. Don't blame Cesaro. It's just one of those dumb freaking luck things that happens in professional wrestling sometimes. But mad props to Cesaro. He didn't get rattled. He didn't lose his grip on what was going on. He didn't do anything. He continued the match. He worked the match. These guys worked around it. I mean, just mad respect to Cesaro. And again, it frustrates me that even when a guy has something like this happens, he can go out there and still put on a top-notch performance and the 70-plus-year-old senile old fuck who likes to blade himself on SmackDown can't see that all these lame asses like gender and such that you push to a main event spot. Here's a guy like Cesaro that actually would probably get more over than any of those freaking guys. So, of course, you keep him where he is. I will say this, talking about cringes, I also cringed when that double spot that Sheamus and Cesaro hit on Rollins and Ambrose didn't lead to the end of the match because ultimately, and I know I'll be in the minority here and that's okay, I'm not crapping on the match because it was not bad. The problem is, is the amount of crap that they did in this match to me was not equivalent to the story. I am okay sometimes with doing a bunch of crash test, crash, crash test dummy bull, okay? Easy for me to say, forgive me please. But it's got to be right. It's got to make sense. It needs to be part of a big, long program, and this is like the payoff to that story arc. It has to involve characters that have a really deep-seated issue that is important enough and interesting enough to where it justifies this crap. But when we get to the point where we're kicking out of everything, if I wanted to watch this type of crap, I'd watch ROH and New Japan more consistently. That's not wrestling to me when they do crap like that, and I don't want to see that in WWE. And it... It annoys me that we've gotten to that point where we start seeing this more and more, frankly. It was a good match, but again, an example similar to back a little while ago with the Usos and the New Day. It was too much. And to me, you get that logical finishing point, and then you keep going, and it just kind of goes, On the Raw Women's Championship five-way, I just don't get it. So many things saying... It's Lady Braun's time, and they just won't go with Lady Braun. They just won't. And I don't get it. I mean, she was, to me, the highlight of the match and the stuff that she did and the stuff that they did to her, especially that quadruple powerbomb thing off the ring apron onto the mats. I mean, damn. Imagine signing up to do that spot as the big girl, and you're not even going to win the freaking match. Um, at least Sasha, Bailey, Emma didn't win here. Uh, but why not have Emma eat the pin? She means nothing. She is dumb. Why would you sit there and have somebody else eat the pin? And in particular, why would you bring Bailey back into this match and shoehorn her in at the 11th hour just to have her eat the pin? And you can sit there and say, well, maybe they'll do something. But even if they do something, it's going to be stupid and you know it. So why not take the person that means the light least in this match, Emma, and have her be the one that loses? This is just the crap about why nobody freaking gets over because they do dumb crap like this. While I felt like this was a night where Nia Jax should have won the title, I am okay with Alexa Bliss retaining for now. Which brings us to John Cena versus Roman Reigns. I talked for a long time about how this was the big money match and how this needed to be 
of featured attraction at WrestleMania. And in a lot of ways, I still stand behind that. Uh, but if we got to the point where we were going to do this and we were going to rush it and this was what we were going to get in terms of the entire story and ultimately the match here at No Mercy, I'd rather they just passed and not done this. I'm sorry. This was terrible. There was a, There's a certain way with these kind of big special attraction type of matches that I feel like this is how they should be worked. You play off of the crowd. You do just enough to keep the crowd interested. Maybe an interesting spot here or there that the crowd can really understand and get behind. But there's no need to go out there and have to do a bunch of crap. Work off the crowd, the crowd, the ambiance, the moment. That is the story. You think about the Hogan Rock type of stuff at WrestleMania 18. From a pure wrestling standpoint, it sucked. But it didn't need to be great from a wrestling standpoint. That's what made it a great match. They worked off of that crowd that was there. Now, that said... This particular crowd in L.A. was actually really into this match. And I think that was as much as anything else. After all these years, there's some Cena fatigue where they're just tired of hating on the guy so much. It's much easier to hate on the newer, fresher guy that you're afraid as much as anything else is going to be the next Cena and Roman Reigns. So it's interesting as the match goes along, you clearly see that for once, Cena is kind of the babyface here, even with the occasional you both suck chant. But this match was lame. This match was a dud. It was a typical no story, uh, bullshit selling, Cena spot by numbers freaking match. Period. And, and, and it was just ridiculous that after all of these years of all these other guys hitting Cena with move after move and spot after spot and finisher after finisher and then Cena would hit one AA out of nowhere the tables have turned apparently this is full full and bore membership into the breakfast club because now Roman Reigns is sitting there and Cena's hitting shit after shit after spot after spot after spot. Reigns mixes in the spear at one point, but just one. But it's again, this and this and this. And Cena ultimately uses a total of four AAs during the match. Tries to lock in the STFU multiple times. None of that works. And then there's one more spear out of nowhere. And that bitch is over. Reigns ultimately used a Cena finish on Cena. That was the one funny kind of ironic thing that I got out of all of this. But ultimately, his match sucked. And then post-match, they sit there and try to force everybody to give Cena this affection and this love because he's going away for a while to do Transformers and other graph. Oh, give me a fucking break. And if that was the finish and you were going to do this crap, again, it just speaks to kind of the selfishness of WWE when it comes to Cena and Cena himself having to sit there and make sure that once again, when it comes to Cena, he's trying to imitate The Rock, even though he spent so many years trying to undercut and belittle The Rock, that he had to sit there and try to do that Royal Rumble 2015 crap with Roman, and he couldn't even do that the same. Like, he couldn't even give the same point that The Rock did. He couldn't even give the same, oh my hell, what the hell am I doing here type of look. That's fitting for Cena, is try to be like The Rock, but you can't in so many ways imaginable. But then afterwards, oh my God, we love you, Sheena. We go miss you and you go act so sad and emotional. If this was the finish, then this should have been the fucking main event. But the fact that this was the finish, knowing goddamn good and well, this is just more disingenuous bullshit. That scene is going to be gone for a while and he'll be fucking back. Just makes me want to freaking vomit. Give me a freaking break. And frankly, based off of that match and that result, there was absolutely nothing to me that indicated that Cena deserved this type of treatment. This was terrible. And honestly, I feel like shit for ever suggesting this needed to wait to WrestleMania. Maybe that's part of the reason why it sucked was because it wasn't at a WrestleMania. It didn't have a WrestleMania type of field or WrestleMania type of build. Instead, we hotshotted it six plus months early, and this is the lame-ass crap that you got. Speaking of lame-ass crap... That Cruiserweight Championship match was terrible, like everybody, I believe, has said. It was really bad. It really dragged. It was just odd. A lot of people, I think, even forgot that it was still coming up. But the ironic thing is, is when you've got Enzo and Neville, how else are you really supposed to book it? Other than doing, like, a complete squash by Neville. Yeah, it was bad. It was terrible. It was too long. It was really dragged out. It sucked. But it was, ironically enough, booked exactly like it should be. And... 
while a lot of people are going to piss on the thought of Enzo Amore being the cruiserweight champion because he can't wrestle and he can't do all this shit. You know what he can do that really none of these other cruiserweights can do? He can get the fucking cruiserweight title to be a match on the freaking pay-per-view card. And not just that, he's running semi-main event. He's the one between freaking Cena Reigns and the Universal Championship between Lesnar and Strowman. So give me a damn break. Because all these guys that can perform in the ring, you know what it's meant for the cruiserweight division? Two hella beans eat a dick. Get over it. Because even with them trying to continually throw out there the backstage crap about Enzo and his ridiculous Virgil slash Beetlejuice looking outfit. The fact is, is the guy is over. The fact is that there are people that care. And honestly, I'm okay with the hooker by crook finish because it's the only way he should beat a Neville. It's one of the few sensible things this company did on this night. He should have been the cruiserweight champion after this night. And he wanted it exactly the right way. And again, if you don't like that, you can eat shit. Because frankly, this cruiserweight division hasn't meant shit to this company all the times that Neville's been, frankly, I felt like a champion that deserved a lot more respect. They've been curtain jerking and pre-showing the whole damn time. And now all of a sudden Enzo's in the division and they're putting him on second to last on a pay-per-view. Give me a damn break. Enzo's a better champ than any of those clowns and all those guys sitting there tweeting their crap about this and that. You know what? Maybe grow a fucking personality and they put the strap on you too. I'm just saying. But yes, I will say that once we got past that Raw Women's Championship, knowing the three matches we had left and knowing the order they were going to come in, I was like, man, maybe this is really where the show is going to pick up and you know, this is going to save the night and I'm going to have good feelings about it. And then that didn't happen, and then it especially didn't happen once we got to the main event. For all those things that we maybe thought that Braun Strowman versus Brock Lesnar could have been, for all the things that it realistically could have and should have been, it ultimately was a chance, above all else, for the WWE to change plans, even if temporarily. It was a chance to do something different, freshen up their product a little bit, and strike, while there was still good timing, and help validate a guy as a top guy with Braun Strowman. They could have given their product some life. They could have cemented a guy as a top star. They could have done a lot of these things. But of course, because the WWE, and in particular Vince McMahon, and his fucking son-in-law Hunter to a larger extent as well, get these ideas stubbornly in their head, and they stick to them, this is the type of crap you get. Now look, I have no problem with having a plan because for so many years this company has had no long-range vision and no long-range plan. So it is refreshing in recent years to at least see when it comes to certain guys in the company, there is some type of long-term plan. There is some type of ultimate vision of where you want to go. That's how it used to be in the old days. That is good. But just because you have plans doesn't mean that those need to be set in stone no matter what. Even the best laid out plan can go to shit at a moment's notice because things change. And the fact that this company is still so stubbornly set on being bound and determined to force you to think that Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal title at WrestleMania 34 is their money match is just an astoundingly stubborn level of stupidity. To where... You've got guys that have got momentum, they've got this, and you're willing to sabotage them because you're afraid that it's going to take away from the golden child when it's not going to take away from the freaking golden child because it is completely independent of the freaking golden child. And if it does take away from the golden child, then what the hell does that say about the golden child any goddamn ways? And, and then when you just look at this match, it sucked. This was something that should have been man. You know, Braun's done some good crap and Lesnar's done some good crap. Even when you look at the fact that a lot of times it's other people doing good crap in Lesnar matches. And frankly, Lesnar is kind of lazy at a lot of this crap. But for all these Brock stands and so on and so forth, ya dude fucking sucks as a champion. Get over it. This whole match sucked. And in particular, we want to talk about the Cena's and the Reigns of the world. And all these guys do all this other crap to them. And then they hit one finisher and that's it. You got Brock doing it again. He did it to Samoa Joe, and now you're doing it to Braun Strowman. You've built up Braun into this big freaking beast of a monster. 
and even early on in the match, you're setting it up like, how the hell is Brock Lesnar going to beat him? And then you do the Breakfast Club Cena shit where it's one F5 and it's all she wrote. And you could tell based off of the response of the crowd that they hated this match and they in particular, they hated this finish. This is a clear cut example of saying, oh my God, we've actually got a sold out crowd here. How nice of a concept that is. Why would you want to send those people home happy? Because we are determined to stubbornly dig in our heels and stand our ground 